Hi, and welcome back to The Secret Life of Parkinson's. I'm Jessica Krauser. And I'm Brian Baker. And today we have with us Leah Dennis. How are you, Leah? I'm good. I Thanks for having me. I don't, I like, I. it's hard still for me. I know you've been married for so long like, to call you Leah Dennis because you're still Leah Bing to me. So Leah and I went to Ohio University together. Is that what the shirt's for? That's what for? my shirt's for, just representing our Bobcats. <laughs> um, but Lee and I met in college and we still have a pretty strong friend group. Um, we're how many years out now? 20 next year? Yes. Yikes. You're young. Uh, thanks. <laughs> thanks. But anyway, so um, when I was uh, diagnosed with Parkinson's, um, I remember Leah reaching out to me and uh, was talking to me about her mom because her mom was diagnosed with Parkinson's a couple years before me. So. Um, Anyways, Lee and I have talked about things over the years uh, of, you know, Parkinson's related items. And she has a really important story. Um, her mom experienced um, Parkinson's psychosis. So that's what this episode is going to be about. Um, it's coming from a, an, an adult child care partner um, perspective and how the family handled it just just all the different things there's a, there's a lot to unfold here um but if you are a care partner of of somebody whether you're the the child or the spouse um this is definitely something to uh to tune into it's a uh, there's so, a lot of information yeah so what is like parkinson's psychosis leah do you want to give a definition for that or do you from your experience um. Yeah, I I can tell you what I experienced um, from it. I don't have the official definition, but I know it's accompanied by hallucinations and delusions, and um, that was definitely part of our journey. Okay, so why don't we just get started? Of like, you know, about and about your mom and and just like the background to get us to where <clears throat> the first hospitalization started. Yeah. So my mom's been active, a runner her whole life. Uh, one day she was out for a run and noticed some pretty significant foot drop. Uh, she was unable to lift her foot. Uh, she said it felt like a heavy weight was attached to it and she just couldn't pick it up. And this was obviously very unusual. Um, from that point forward, we started multiple doctor's visits, batteries of tests. At one point she was convinced she had MS and um, it was definitely a concerning time, but ultimately in April 2015, she got her diagnosis of Parkinson's and we know that foot drop now is related to Parkinson's dystonia, causes her foot to invert um, and it medication has certainly made it better. She doesn't run today, but she certainly keeps incredibly active with hiking biking walking doing all the things mm -hmm. um although she really found herself an avid runner but she now pursues things outside of that that still help her keep to her exercise routines and keeping her feeling really great and then for a long time she wasn't talking about it though right oh no yeah once the diagnosis came she was never more relieved to find out my sister was pregnant than i was pregnant and my sister-in-law was pregnant and she said definitively we are not talking about my diagnosis my doctor told me and i wasn't in the room with her to confirm that her doctor did tell her that she would have 10 good years and so she just didn't want to talk about it she wasn't ready to talk about it she was going to focus on being a grandma to her grandkids and the three grandkids that were on the way. So within six months of her diagnosis, we were all pregnant and that's what we were to talk about, not anything to do with her diagnosis. But she started early on having night terrors, right? Yeah, so um, pretty early on, my dad confided in me and said, has your mom said anything about uh, what's going on at night? And I said, no, you know, tell me what's going on. And he goes, well, she punched me. And I was like, hey, what? Back up. Tell me what's going on here. And he said, I, I don't know what's going on really, but in the middle of the night, she'll wake up or I don't know that she's actually awake, but she will be screaming, thrashing out. Um, 
and often he gets caught in the crossfire of the thrashing and he when we were having this conversation just looked so overtired and i just said you know how are you sleeping dad and he's like i don't we're up multiple times throughout the night um you know one of the biggest challenges as a family and supporting my mom through the diagnosis other than not being able to talk about the fact that she had parkinson's for multiple years was her aversion to taking medicine which is really scary when you have a disease that you need to be on the proper medication um, to feel well Mm -hmm. so she was very much not on board with any medication to try to help reduce the Mm -hmm. night terrors which we now know is called REM behavior disorder RBD um, where it's part of Parkinson's and there's treatments out there for it where you can help reduce waking. She has thankfully come to a place where she's accepted that medication and not affected by this as she was before. But there was probably a one or two year period where my parents both existed on virtually no sleep as a result of that. Well, it's interesting because Brian actually or is it okay if I bring this up? Yeah, I just wrote it down. Okay. So, Brian, just what, last week or two, or last week, you started having that thrashing in the middle of the night. And yeah. You, and you I hit woke, your dog. I woke up kicking kicking at my dog, I should say, not necessarily kicking him. But, <laughs> yeah. And it's scary because I, I text Jessica, Melissa, and Steve. I was like, you know, here's what happened. And, you know, and for me, like, is this gonna happen more often when I have somebody else is in bed in the bed with me? You know, when they've gotten hurt, um, yeah, it's it is it's a scary thing, to, and I've had a second one last night. Yeah, but there is medication I... for that. Leah, sorry, there, there is medication for that. Yeah, um, when I was doing a little research before this, there are different medications that are listed that can help lessen. Um, a couple of them are pretty heavy sleep meds, which mm. was why she didn't want to take those. Those certainly come with their own set of side effects. Mm-hmm. So I think it's a manner of what you know how bad it's affecting your sleep. And it got to a point where it was it was almost every night, and I visited a couple of times where I'd be woken up in the middle of the night and it was a blood curdling scream. I'll never forget it. The hairs on my arm stood up. I I thought she was being attacked. I heard it from two floors away and I just thought, wow, you know, she's not getting any sleep and oh my gosh, my dad does this almost every night and it just, oh, I had so much empathy for what they were going through but it's an i'm so happy to report it's in a much better place and it Mm -hmm. happens few and and far between so what then what was coming up now so that was in the beginning right yeah and then how did things progress so you know we had multiple years of things just going really well Mm -hmm. outside of that physically she wasn't experiencing too many um motor symptoms and you know we would see subtle changes but things were going well i would say there was a period of there wasn't anything high or low or concern Mm -hmm. we just kind of going through young kids grandkids visit things were good then one day i would say this was you know last year the year yeah last year Mm -hmm. the beginning of the year my mom said she made this blanket statement, your dad and I aren't sleeping in the same bed anymore. I can't handle his snoring, not another night. And my siblings and I were sitting there like, huh, you guys are high school sweethearts. You've been sleeping next to each other for I don't know how many years. Dad's has snored for I don't know how many years. And all of a sudden, she's at, you know, she's at her limit. They're not, they're not gonna sleep in the same bed anymore. And when she announced this, you know, she's I saw my dad chuckle and then I saw a little bit of sadness behind his eyes. And I was like, okay, he's not on board with this. This was a unilateral decision made by my mom. And so when my siblings and I were talking, I thought maybe she's just feeling like she feels she's keeping him up at night Mm -hmm. and she wants him to get better sleep. I'm like, I can get around that. But again, he's he's been okay with it for all these years and Mm -hmm. they're just so close 
to each other. I couldn't believe he would want to be in a separate room from her. Mm -hmm. And he didn't. But from that point forward, it was we're in separate beds. When they came to visit, I would have to make up a bed for her and make up a separate bed for him. And my kids couldn't wrap their mind around why grandma and grandpa weren't sleeping in the same bed. And we all just went along with it. But you and said then, that's kind of like one of the first red flags. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. It was so unusual and so uncharacteristic. And um, but I didn't know what to do or what to say. And it yeah. certainly wasn't going to insert myself in the middle of their marriage and figure yeah. they'd, they'd work it out. Uh, but I could sense sadness from my dad. Yeah. He didn't like that. He didn't like it at all. He didn't like being away from her. He didn't like being a floor above her because yeah. she made the guest room on the top floor. He didn't He didn't like anything about it. So what was the next red flag? So last October, we had a girls weekend. My mom's one of eight siblings. She has five sisters and all of her sisters have daughters. So uh, we got all the girls together, did a fun girls trip to um, Ogilvy, West Virginia. We all stayed in a cabin got everybody together. And I also knew after my mom made that decision with my dad, she was also, when we'd met up at hotels for various functions, whether it was a wedding or her and my sister were coming together for a girls weekend, she would always say, I'm going to get my own hotel room. I don't want to be the reason nobody sleeps at night. And we've all shared the same house with her and confirmed like, mom, we're okay with it. It doesn't bother us. We're mm -hmm. happy to share a room with you. It's okay. So for this girl's trip to try to keep her comfortable, there was tons of bedrooms. I made sure she was in her own bedroom right next to my sister and I. At one point she pulls me aside and she just said, I'm so sad that you want me to be alone. And I was like, what? She goes, you put me in a room all by myself and you're sharing a room with your sister. And I was like, oh gosh, mom, I guess I just assumed that's what makes you most comfortable. That's what yeah, you request. you've been doing you're worried about waking anybody up, but you're right next to us. And I go, I see Nicole, my sister, less than I see you. And we're just, you know, catching up for a girls weekend. I'm like, do you want me to rearrange it? And she kind of just was short and walked away. And I was like, that's really unusual for mm -hmm. my mom, first mm -hmm. of all. She's always so kind and polite. Yeah. And never going to make my sister or I feel uncomfortable. It was very unusual that she cornered me and said that. And Throughout the weekend, I noticed she was either high or low. And when she was low, she just seemed really sad. Then at one point, my aunt pulled me aside and said, I'm really worried about your mom. She thinks everybody thinks she's crazy and that you and your sister are ignoring her. And I was like, oh, does this have to do with the bedroom situation? Like I talked to her, like, let's just, I'm not gonna play into this. Yeah, We're all here together, a bunch of women that never see each other much like nobody cares that mom has parkinson's i'm trying mm -hmm. to say that in the nicest yeah. way she's had this diagnosis for many years and she doesn't have a big letter p on her forehead mm -hmm. everybody loves her and let's just enjoy our weekend we're getting spa treatments and mm -hmm. playing games and having a great time so i brushed that off and then the next red flag leading up to the first hospitalization would be that was october and then thanksgiving right after we all came home to Cleveland. And I noticed my mom was just super exuberant. And again, my mom's not the loudest person in a room. She's kind, she's quiet, she's thoughtful. She was bouncing from one grandkid to the next, just excited, excitable, like someone wound her up, you know? And I just remember saying, are you feeling okay? She's like, yeah. I'm just so excited. All my grandkids are here. And that's just not a normal state. She's never just yeah. like uh, so excited wired. to be yeah, yeah. anywhere. And she doesn't drink, you know, so yeah. I knew like she didn't have one too many cocktails. She's <laughs> never drank my whole life. So I was just like, this is really bizarre behavior. Uh -huh. And so the day after I just kind of cornered her and I just said, is everything okay, mom? Like, you just didn't see yourself last night. And she's like, I was trying to make sure everybody knew I was okay. I'm okay. It's like, why do you need to try to make sure everybody mm -hmm. knows you're okay if you're okay? 
I'm just, I, I know everybody just looks at me like waiting to see what is going to happen uh, because I've got Parkinson's. And I was like, mm. I'm sorry you feel that way. You know, that's got to be a terrible feeling and you don't need to put on a show and nobody's judging you or looking at you. It was, you know, the first time our family had come together for Thanksgiving since COVID and everyone was just so yeah. happy to be together with our greater extended family all eyes weren't on you. I was like, so I is that, your daughter. Is that just something noticed. like that with psychosis that, that starts out with as like they almost internalize and think they they think they know what other people are thinking or, you know, yes. that, is that? Have you, have you, it, it was repetitive, this crazy. Uh -huh. People are thinking I'm crazy. Have you, have you been like that? What? Like, I know, I remember like I, I would go to a restaurant I hate eating around people because I'm like, everybody's no. sta everybody staring at me. I know they're staring at me. And part of that is, is because early on, before I was diagnosed, somebody's like, Brian, what the heck was that? I was took a bite of food and just the coordination between my mouth and my, you mm -hmm. know, the timing. Yeah. Oh, how and, slow it goes. Like, ah. Uh... Uh, and it was so slow. And they're like, what is that? And like, they were joking around about it, but. It was like that, that one thing that. Yeah. So now, so for the longest time, whenever I'd go to a restaurant, I'd be, I hated eating. I still don't like care to eat in front of people, but hmm. I'd be like, I'd, I'd run a booth back in the corner where nobody could see. Yeah. No, I haven't, I haven't had that, but I mean, and who's to say I'm not going yeah. to, but. I'm not, I'm not like that anymore, but I was. Yeah. Huh. huh. It's just things, I guess, to, to continue to look out for. But this actually, this continues much it goes much deeper. So I know, I'm sorry. So, and everybody hang in there because yeah. there's there's so much more to, to learn. But go ahead, Leah. So I think those those instances or those things where I was trying not to, I try to be really sensitive to, I don't want to be staring at my mom and looking for something different every time I see her since we're eight hours away and I don't see her every month. So I think I was trying to find different ways to explain away the behavior every mm -hmm. time I saw her. So after Thanksgiving, you know, I, I didn't have any over, I was not overly concerned in any way, just kind of like, okay, it made sense to me when she explained, mm -hmm. I just wanted everyone to see that I'm doing okay. And I was like, okay, but your, your um, acting skills are not great, you know, so just <laughs> be normal. Um, so shortly after Thanksgiving, very early December, I get a call, a panicked, panicked call from my dad saying, your mom's in the hospital. I don't have a lot of information to give you. Please call your siblings. And I, I can't reach out to all of you. Just call Jason and Nicole. Let them know mom's in the hospital. There was an incident at work and I'm on my way. And I said, okay, dad, are you in the car? Do you want to talk? Can you tell me what's going on? And he said uh, what they were able to tell me, they being her coworkers, was that mom said her heart felt like it was racing. She was unable to walk as without assistance. Um, and she felt zinging. This is a, a common occurrence. The She just described it as zinging in her extremities and her arms and her legs zinging. And so when someone tried to ask what that meant, she just kind of said like lightning bolts in her mm -hmm. arms and her legs. And uh, so they went to the hospital and um, my dad's not the best communicator in crisis situations, which is challenging when you're not local mm -hmm. and right there and can't be on the scene. So I didn't hear from him for a while. He would check in and say, you know, we're still waiting. If you recall a year ago, we were still kind of coming out of that staffing crisis yeah. and that you would hear about the wait times in the ERs just being outrageous. And so we were still on the tail end of that. And so they sat in the ER for quite a long time, um, just waiting to be seen. Initial checks, vital signs, everything was okay. They weren't worried she was having a heart attack or anything like that. Um, so that things were relatively calm in the ER, but of course they were both concerned. Mm -hmm. She eventually gets taken back and they confirm after a battery of tests, like, there's no incidents of heart attack or stroke or anything that we can see that would cause great alarm. Mm -hmm. We think she might've had a panic attack. Okay. And so my dad was like, okay, she's been getting more stressed out 
at work, things have been harder. Mm -hmm. My sister and I had been spending the last year or so saying, hey, maybe dial it back, Mm -hmm. maybe go part time. Um, All you do is talk about how stressed you are at work, how systems are changing and you can't keep up just saying, you know, my my brain can't do this anymore. And, you know, we would just say then, let's take a pause, let's step back, let's take care of yourself. You're not taking care of yourself. And she was so worried about uh, retiring and what effect that would have on her brain if she wasn't using it Mm -hmm. in the manner she'd been using it for work. So she was under a lot of stress. So we said, maybe that just kind of hit ahead at work. Mm -hmm. She just couldn't fake it till she made it anymore. And all that stress just led to a panic attack. It seemed to make sense. So they get home, uh, they don't keep her overnight, they send her home, say follow up with your PCP in a week, uh, you know, try to relax. My sister's a nurse practitioner, she came swooping home and said, I want to read all the my chart notes, I want to check everything, I want to read all the test results and make sure I don't see anything Mm -hmm. that gives me any kind of cause um, for concern. And so she didn't, everything looked fairly normal in her eyes and just said, yeah, you know, get in with your PCP mom. Um, We really need to talk about you reducing or retiring. Mm -hmm. And, you know, she said, I'm going to, I'm just going to work through the end of the year and then I'll be done. So this was December. So everyone was like, okay. So my sister stayed and uh, I think for like a night or so, everything seemed to be calm, drove home, the next day or two days later and right as she's about to be home she got a call from my dad saying can you turn around i think it's happening again and uh she goes dad call aunt joe my mom's sisters are all nurses so that helps having a family (laughs) of nurses and she's local so she said call aunt joe see if she'll come over with her um stethoscope Mm -hmm. and a pressure cuff and all that good stuff and just get her eyes on mom before you go back to the hospital. Cause my dad said, you know, we waited so long. I would just hate to go back to the hospital if it wasn't necessary. Right. By the time he gets on the phone with my aunt Joe, my mom is screaming in the background that she's dying. She's dying. My aunt Joe hears that. Here's my mom's tone. And she goes, Jeff, I don't even recognize that voice in the background. Hang up and call 911. Um, there's nothing I can do that's gonna help her. You mm-hmm. need to call 911. So he did. Um, he was obviously nervous about going back to an ER. Yeah. They went to a different hospital. Um, my aunt said, I'll meet you there with her other sister so that my dad had some support there. Yeah, This was what my dad described as the nightmare uh, ER visit. And they were, the totality of the wait time in the ER was six hours in the waiting room. And for the bulk of that time, my mom sat and screamed that she was dying and uh, begged my dad. She said, he just said it was so heartbreaking. She would turn to him and just say, why are you letting me die? I thought you loved me. Please, please save me. And so my dad, you know, said, he's like, Leah, I promise you, I faithfully went up to that receptionist asking her in the ER to please get us a room so my mom your mom could see that I was doing something I wasn't just letting her die and I was like oh dad I believe you I believe you so this episode it's not like a like a panic attack episode it's like it was ongoing it was I'm dying I'm so afraid I'm dying my heart is racing she had the zinging but it was everything was overshadowed with this extreme fear of death that she believed she was dying and nobody was listening to her um at one point a gentleman sitting across from her just i think he was on in blue maybe a denim top and denim bottoms looked like a police officer to her because of the blue and said officer you need to take this man and arrest him he's letting me die it's my husband and my dad just said he was just So what did they he give her? Like, know what to do. Did they did they give her something when they did get her back there to the room? Yeah, immediately uh, gave her a, a sedative, um, and my dad said that obviously it instantly calmed her down. But 
they didn't have any record of her hospital stay um, from the days prior. It was a different hospital system. My dad was certainly thrust into being an advocate and care partner overnight. It mm-hmm. was very clear it was not something that he was preparing for or mm-hmm. prepared for. Um, they ultimately discharged her, mm-hmm. not even keeping her, not even admitting her, um, just saying we're checking all of her vitals and nothing is of concern. Did they know she She's had Parkinson's? Yeah. Did they know about her Parkinson's? Yeah, he did tell her that she had Parkinson's because he was worried about what they would prescribe her Mm -hmm. not um, interacting appropriately with her Parkinson's meds. So they did send him home with, I think, a week's worth of anti-anxiety medication saying, take this, get in with your PCP in the next 24 to 48 hours. Because he told them they were just at the hospital and they said, you need to get in to the PCP immediately. Mm Mm-hmm. And uh, so sent her home. Uh, We got little bits of information from my aunts. My dad was not returning anybody's phone call. So um, it was alarming. My sister, brother, and I are on a text chain just lighting it up with, do you have any news? Do you have any news? What's going on? Have you heard anything? Is mom in a room? And I think my dad just shut down and he was just in this panic state Mm -hmm. of, I don't know what to do. I've never seen her like this. I can't help her. She's angry at me. Yeah. I, I I think he just shut shut down. So um sent her home. She slept. He could sleep because, you know, they hit her with a pretty heavy dose of a sedative. Uh my brother and I made plans to take off work and come home. He had a new baby at the time, so he also came home. But my dad was kind of funny. He was like, just, just wait, you know, don't, don't come home just yet. And I said, no, Mm -hmm. not happening. Mm -hmm. I'm not getting enough information from you. Yeah. I need to put my arms around mom. This is two hospitalizations. I don't feel like you have a handle on things. I'm saying this in my head, not to him, (laughs) but lovingly said, thanks dad. I'm I'm coming home. Taking over. Yeah. Yeah. I just, I just need to put my arms around mom and, and be there to help support you. Yeah. Um, in, in any way that I can. So she went to see her family physician after that episode, that second Yes. Okay. So I said, you've got, <laughs> I get home. And I said, did you schedule the appointment? He goes, it's on our list of things to do. <laughs> <laughs> like dad, put it at the top of the list. Yeah. That's what I said. I was like, this has to be a number one. So my mom was still really sleepy. We, we find, you know, her PCP contact information. I was like, talk to me about mom's meds and he's like um well she keeps some up here and she keeps some here and she keeps some by her bed and i was like okay do you have her med list and he's like well you know your mom does all that and i was like okay so we need to figure out um what meds mom is on when she's supposed to take them because i'm thinking she missed some meds while Uh she was in the hospital and, and he didn't know uh, the schedule or the list or anything like that. No, no. So well, my because brother by and that, I but 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 up until that point, she was. I mean, she was. She's fine. She's taking care of yes. herself. Yes, he has gone to a few neurology appointments with her, uh-huh. but I'm pretty certain she didn't want him to go, and she was aggressively telling him not to come. In the in the recent when all this was happening, I felt like she must have been feeling like she was having a hard time mm-hmm. navigating all of this alone, mm-hmm. but she didn't want to express that she was having a hard time yeah. navigating this alone. She wanted my dad to see her as his wife who mm-hmm. handled mm-hmm. everything yeah. and that nothing has changed. Mm-hmm. So we started gathering up the pill bottles, reading what was on the pill bottle. And then when my mom woke up, was asking her, and we just started getting some really concerning responses with, well, I don't take that as it says on the bottle. I, I cut that one in half and I'm weaning off of that one because it makes me sick. And this one, my my doctor told me to stop taking it. And I was like, okay, do you have your my chart notes that would say that from your doctor? Yeah. I'm just questioning now, did we get to this place because we've got meds that aren't being taken regularly yeah. or she's 
self-prescribing what she thinks is what the right thing is to do. And then it comes out, well, I don't get along with my neurologist. He doesn't listen to me. He thinks I'm crazy. And he's not listening when I'm telling him a certain med is making me feel this way. So I was like, okay, that's another thing we've uncovered. We need to get a new get neurologist. Mom. Yeah, a new neurologist and one that's local because she was driving an hour and a half to Perrysburg or Toledo to see her neurologist. And they live in Cleveland. And so that's not great in a crisis. Um, and if it's not somebody that she was seeing eye to eye with or having yeah. a good trusting relationship with. So that was like, okay, un uncover that. We got the med list. She was getting really angry that we were inserting ourselves and trying to get a handle on the uh -huh. meds because we didn't understand it. And I was like, you're right. I don't understand it. I, I don't understand that you're dosing yourself in ways that aren't prescribed on the bottles. Mm -hmm. And, you know, you've got all these notes from your doctor's visits, but, you know, wouldn't your doctor write that somewhere to say, I want you to now only take certain amounts. And then my dad was, was clueless in, in all these areas. So we did a lot of going through my chart notes, getting mm -hmm. medications together in preparation for our visit with the PCP that was now scheduled for the next morning. Mm -hmm. I said, I'd really love to just type up the events of the last week so that we can provide that to your PCP. And mm -hmm. she said, I'll do that. But I want you to know that you and your father aren't going to say a word when you go into that doctor's office with me. Ooh. It's my life, and I'm going to be the one to talk to the doctor, and I'm not taking any new medications. I was just like, okay. Okay. <laughs> I respect that. But I want to make sure that we've captured in these notes all of the events from the last week with accuracy so that we're providing her with the real story. Yeah. So did you she go said, with her? Okay. Yes. Yes. So thankfully, um, that doctor's appointment occurred before I had to fly home. I got to meet her PCP. She really, really liked her. We uncovered that she's in need of a new neurologist. Her PCP had a great suggestion of one in network in the same hospital as a hospital system that she partnered with regularly. Mm -hmm. And so my mom was open to that. We were able to get her in for an appointment within, um, I think, two weeks. Mm -hmm. we, we tried. It was hard. Usually they're booked out further, but they were making a special exception to get her in in two weeks. So I felt leaving them, okay, we've got a, we've got a plan in place. The PCP also uncovered that my mom was taking too much of her thyroid medicine. And mm -hmm. she said to my mom, this could be causing some of these issues. And there was definitely a sense of relief with my mom and my dad, but she also said, I still want to run some tests mm -hmm. and um, convinced my mom to consider taking an anti-anxiety until they could really figure out what was going on. Yeah. So by the time I hopped on a plane, got home, talked to my parents later that night, they were like, yep, this is it. We read all about this thyroid medication. Your mom was overdosing on the medication and this was it this was this is what it is um my dad was even like i'm gonna be going back to work next week and i was just like whoa <laughs> you know so much happened yeah in the last five hours you guys seem to have gotten it all figured out and i am thoroughly not convinced yeah. but i'm just gonna take a deep breath mm -hmm. and glad they're aligned on this glad my mom's taking this um anti-anxiety medication mm -hmm. and uh, for the time being and she has an appointment set with a new neurologist um and i forgot to mention while i was there visiting the night before we got in with her pcp um that next morning she had started experiencing one of these episodes we were on the couch watching a movie and she just said i'm really cold jeff i need a blanket it's just this tone i could just sense something was about to happen it's it didn't yeah. sound like her it didn't look like her and she started saying her arms were zinging her heart was racing and she was dying i immediately pulled out my phone got my sister on facetime and like put it in front of my mom's face saying nicole's on the call she's a nurse practitioner she's gonna run through a battery of tests mom to talk through what's happening to you right now because yeah. my dad is over in a corner white ghost white and he just said i can't go to the er again i can't do that again lee i cannot do that again and i was like 
Okay, I'm really glad I'm here. Mm -hmm. Let's just figure out if we can get my mom to take this anti-anxiety medication and if my sister can talk her off the ledge. Um, so we, we did go through that with the PCP that I was there. I observed this happening. And ultimately after an hour on FaceTime, my mom, my sister convinced my mom that she wasn't dying, um, that the, you know, kind of the virtual visit mm -hmm. assessment that she did didn't feel that mom needed to go to the hospital and that she had her doctor's appointment first thing in the morning. And so we were able to, you know, escape a, a ER visit with my sister's yeah. help. Which and so really at this point, though, still no one's mentioning and, and you didn't even know about such thing as a Parkinson's psychosis. No. Nope. Never heard of it. Wasn't aware of it. Or PCP didn't mention it. It was just this. Pat, you're overwhelmed. Um, you when, know, it's probably you're having panic attacks and you need to think about, you know, cutting back yeah. at work or retiring. Um, and then it immediately was this uh, overdosing on the thyroid medicine. So when did it reading. get to the PD psychosis? Like, how did that even, how did you finally get that diagnosis? Yeah. So I go home. My sister had made plans to come back about four days later uh -huh. to check in, make sure that the new medication mom was on and changing her thyroid meds, but adding this and anxiety was you know, going okay, and that my mom was actually taking it. That was our biggest concern, yeah. that she just was mismanaging her medications. She's mm -hmm. averse to any new medication. Any medication she tries, she reads the pamphlet of the side effects, and she has all of the worst <laughs> ones immediately. And so it, it it's just, and this isn't anything new. This is, you know, kind of, I love my mom, and this was just kind of my whole life. Just, you know, medicine is bad, and you don't take it, mm -hmm. and if she ever had to take it, she had all the worst side effects. So I was concerned, and I told my sister, I don't think she's going to take this. Um, I think she'll hide it from my dad. Yeah. I think they're in a very precarious place right now, because he's trying to do all the right things, and she's still in a very different state where she's snippy, and it's not that's not mom. That's, mm -hmm. that's not mom. Mm -hmm. So she said, yep, I'll plan to come home. I'm off Friday. I'll drive home and I'll spend the weekend. And I was like, okay, I felt, I felt good about that. Um, I remember it was midweek. No, I would got, I'd gotten home. And then the next day my mom had said, did you have any bed bugs in your suitcase when you got home? And I was like, what? No, no. Why? She goes, well, I think we have bed bugs. And I was like, really? Um, why do you think that? And she goes, I think we brought them home from one of the hospital visits, Leah, and I think they're everywhere. And I was like, well, Jason and I were just home and I didn't notice anything. Yeah. And that'd be weird that they weren't there for four days while I was there from your hospitalization. And then all of a sudden they appeared, you know, after I left, I go, I don't no. So does she my see dad, them or does she just yes. think? Oh, she sees no, them. No, she saw them and my dad was going along with it. So I was like, okay, okay. I wasn't like dumping my suitcase right. out, washing everything in hot water. So there was a part of me like, okay, I'm, I'm not sure I'm on board with this, but dad's saying he believes it is happening. So hmm. I'll just roll with this. Yeah. And then nobody heard from mom and dad for like a day or two. And so the sibling text chain, you know, were firing up like, hey, have you heard from mom or dad? Have you heard from mom or dad? My brother, my sister and I and were like, no, it's been radio silent. And they're like, we did hear about the bed bugs. And I'm like, yeah. Um, but has anybody confirmed there's bed bugs outside of mom and dad saying there's bed bugs? They're like, no. And my brother, same thing. He was like, we were just there. I don't think they have bed bugs. Yeah. So I had tickets to take my kids to the Nutcracker. And I was like, oh, do I go? Do I don't go? I'm just in this this, this really stressed state. And I was yeah. like, I need to escape reality. I'm taking them to the show. And... Um, before, oh, because before I had left, my sister had said, dad texted me and told me not to come home. And I oh, because she was supposed to come home and visit that weekend. Yeah. 
And I was like, well, you're going to go home, right? And she's like, well, he told me not to. I go, who cares? That's mm-hmm. very strange. You need to go home. He's mm-hmm. telling you not to come home. That's a red, red flag. flag. Yeah, you need to go home. And she's the baby of the family and, you know, more worried about upsetting my parents than I am. She's like, I, I he told me not to go, so I don't know that I'm going to go. I'm like, put your nurse practitioner hat on. Take off your youngest child. child. Um, and go. So I was like, okay, this is a little strange. We go to the Nutcracker and I get a call from my dad and kind of similar to the first call where he said, I I can't talk right now. I need you to tell your brother and sister that we're back at the hospital. (sighs) And my heart just dropped. And, uh, he said, "I, I can't talk. I go, Dad, you got to give me something. He's like, I cannot talk. Um, I will I will give you updates. And that was that. And so I, I, you know, texted my siblings, got the kids home. And it was three hours, three excruciating hours where, I mean, it's just silence. And I'm mm. just badgering my siblings. Like, has anybody heard anything? And my sister said, I'm calling him on repeat and I'm about to tell him that if he doesn't call me back you know I'm gonna like, call the hospital and start asking for updates like you know yeah. I am a nurse practitioner let me help dad like get me in the conversation because after the last two hospitalizations we're like dad is mom's advocate dad yeah. needs an advocate yeah like, we you just, can't always do it by yourself yes and Nicole's like let me get on the phone with the doctor like, let me help you, dad. Let's let me do this. So when she threatened to call the hospital and try to, you know, find out where he was or what was going on, he finally calls back. And this was just, oh, just the hardest thing to hear that like the last 48 hours were just so hard and traumatic for him. But we didn't hear from them for a couple of days for good reason because they had moved out of the house temporarily into a hotel room because of the bed bugs. They had gotten to the point where they had thrown out multiple mattresses. My mom put boxes and bins of clothes at the end of the driveway to be picked up, um, you know, in garbage because the house was infested, according to her. So they move into a local hotel I think they might have even gone to two different ones because the first one, my mom had found bed bugs. So they checked out, went into another one where apparently she did see bed bugs, uh, but said, let's just pull all the bedding off and we're going to go to the store and we're going to, yeah, after they spent the first night, she said, we need to go get new bedding. We we must have brought them here. That's why we're seeing them in all these places. Aww. We've brought the bed bugs. So they go to Target first. Uh, she tells my dad that they need to leave. She sees the bet. She sees a bug, and um, so they go to Walmart. And everything's okay at Walmart. Then my mom says she's just not feeling good, uh, nauseous, and I think overwhelmed with all the events that were going on. So my dad said he walked her to the pharmacy, sat her down, had everything that they needed to check out, went to the checkout line. It was a longer line, but he got up to the checkout. And as he was in the process of checking all of his things out, he looks up and he sees an ambulance pull up. They come in and they start making their way towards the pharmacy. And he said, I know they're going for your mom. So he walks over there. They have her strapped into the gurney. And from what he could tell, someone thought she was having a seizure. Mm -hmm. And they called 911. She couldn't articulate that she was here with anybody. Um, And so they went off to the hospital. So my sister was hearing all of this with obvious shock, hurt that my dad had kept us all in the dark and just asked him she goes i just have to ask you one question dad did you ever see any bed bugs and he said no and she just said why would you go along yeah why did he keep going along with it and he said when i told her i didn't see them she would scream at him and say i'm not crazy why don't you believe me you don't love me anymore you're gonna leave me because I'm crazy. And he said it was easier 
to go along with it and not fight with her because he didn't know what to do. And she Mm -hmm. goes, okay, dad, those are red flags. You can't do that on your, on your own. Mm -hmm. Um, Mom needs help and you're not helping by pretending. Yeah. Yeah. And uh, then she said, where are you right now? And he goes, I'm at the hotel. And she goes, what? It was late. It was like 10, 30, 11 o'clock. He goes, she goes, how are you not with mom? You cannot leave her alone in this state. She doesn't have an advocate. She doesn't have anybody there speaking on her behalf. Mm -hmm. What are you doing? And he goes, she made me leave. She told me to go back to the hotel, put all the sheets and the bed together so that when she was discharged, she would have the room all set and ready with everything that they had just bought. Mm Mm-hmm. And my sister was beside herself. She goes, I, in that moment, I had to just totally remove myself as a family member and insert myself as a as a professional in talking to a family member in crisis. And mm-hmm. she's like, I just, I couldn't. I, she's like, I was just so, so upset. And she's like, I had to hide that from him. And I just, she said she had to tell him, Dad, you need to stop right now and you need to go to the hospital. And then she said, wait, did you tell them about the bed bugs? And this is her third hospitalization. And he goes, no, she said she would divorce me. She pulled me close and said, if you tell anybody about this, I will leave you. I will divorce you. And uh, he he believed it. He literally didn't see her in crisis or needing help in that moment. He just felt so unsure of what his role was and how what the right thing to do was and he just was compliant to her yeah yeah so was it that hospital stay that they finally had a neurologist on so yes my mom said you go to you have to go to the hospital right now you cannot leave her unless you can get one of her sisters to come sit with her but you can't do that until you speak to her doctor or someone who lis- will listen and tell them exactly what has transpired. Mm-hmm. So he did just that. I can't remember if he was talking to the physician who was rounding at the time. It wasn't the person who had initially seen her at admission, told them everything. And first thing in the morning, uh, that person believed him, you know, went into action. And first thing in the morning, she had a whole care team in her room that consisted of psych and a neurologist that was rounding. And that made all the difference in the world. Um, It was pretty immediate. They said, we think she's suffering from Parkinson's psychosis. We're gonna run some more tests, but between psych and the neurologist together, um, you know, form that opinion. She ended up having a similar episode to the one that she'd been having where she felt like she was dying. They were all there to observe it thankfully Mm -hmm. it didn't happen at home it happened in the hospital they kept her for three days so that they could really watch her see her and the strangest thing my mom formed this bond with the neurologist who they got really close and she just said pat i'd love to take you on as a patient i can help Mm -hmm. you i specialize in this and I feel like we can we can get you well again, but you have to trust me. And that's what my mom didn't have with any of her other neurologists. Any trust, um, didn't believe they had her best interest. They were just trying to feed her medication that was harming her. And I think being in this state and just being so completely exhausted with this third hospitalization, she one didn't have any more fight yeah, in left her to say, I won't take any medication. Um, but was scared enough that she also didn't want to believe that this was going to be her state Yeah, for the duration of her life. She wanted to be well again, and she trusted that this neurologist and this care team had her, her best interest at heart. And, um, and she is well, that was, she is hmm. well, she is well now. She is so well. Does she, um, does her, she reflect back on, like, does she remember all the things that she how she acted or what she did or does she not talk about it she doesn't really talk about it and when we talk about it it like she gets so sad like 
that must have been so scary for you. I'm sorry I did that. I'm like, you don't need to say sorry. This was outside of your control. You yeah. couldn't control what's happening to you. You can be um, a better patient with your medication. You can take those as prescribed. And if you have concerns, talk to your doctor and listen to your doctor. And she has a doctor now that she trusts to have those conversations mm-hmm. and who trusts her. And it it's made all the difference in the world. But also her and my dad, as a result of that, were forced into retirement. Mm-hmm. And that was a blessing um, because they could take the stresses of work off the table, mm-hmm. both of them. And the next few months were really my dad learning how to be a care partner. Um, my mom really leaning into him and then getting really irritated. I think I, I, call it her loving shadow Mm -hmm. that she appreciated to a point and then was like back up let me you know start driving on my own again Mm -hmm. it was a while till she was healthy enough to do that where the medications were adjusted to a point where she was responding and feeling well Um, I'm sure as you know the whole medication adjustment and dosages that that takes a while to get to the right place so there was an adjustment period, but I can say now, almost a year later, um, they're in the best place they've been in a really, really long time. Wow. They exercise together, they explore the area around each other, they really appreciate this retired time together more than um, they ever would have, I think, had this had they not experienced this together. So So is it a combination of like I'm assuming there's like a psychosis medication? Um yeah. is it, so is it a combo of like medication and seeing a psychiatrist or is it just medication and exercise? Like what yeah. is the best it, thing? It was um medication was a big piece and being compliant with her medication, trusting that the doctor wasn't trying to harm her uh-huh. with the medication and um, so that was a number one, the medication, um, getting a neurologist that she trusted and listened to her and that a plan that she follows. And then honestly, as I was saying before, her whole persona has been wrapped around exercise her mm-hmm. whole life. And just she wasn't exercising to the level that made her feel good because she was so stressed out with work. So taking that work piece off the table Mm -hmm. and being able to really focus on her health and well-being, um, I think is the other piece of that puzzle that was missing. So, um, you know, the the medicine, the trust between her and her doctor, and then the the health and well-being that she's been able to really focus on. So how long was it, I mean, I know we talked a couple of different doctor visits, but how long was it from like the first episode where, you know, she's moving out to, of the bedroom until, um, the most, their latest, the last hospital stay. Yeah. Yeah. I think the changing of the bedrooms was probably at the beginning of last year, January. So I mean, this and all, then this all happened I, fairly quick then. Oh yeah. Yes. Yes. And then when I saw her last October and November and noticed those changes to the three hospitalizations that quickly followed, that was in December. So, yeah, it, it was, was all back to back. Mm-hmm. Is there like, did you ever talk to the doctor about like, is it, could you have found it earlier? Like, you know, even just with those first initial like changes, her being like super hyper or whatever, would that, I wonder if is if that looked at or diagnosed as like early psychosis or? I think, I think looking backwards, if my dad maybe was more in tune to what Parkinson's was or is, I mean, that seems mm. funny to say. No, like, I know what you mean diagnosed with Parkinson's he didn't know much about Parkinson's and he really let my mom handle everything and I think had he understood more about Parkinson's and um, gone to maybe some support groups he would have been able to better alert us kids who only see her you know, I wish I saw her more than I do but in spurts where again I'm not trying to look for 
changes yeah. or try to say, you know, boy, you seem different than the last month when I saw you. Um, I think maybe we could have caught things ahead of time or if if the neurologist and the PCP were working together, um, perhaps that would have helped. But or, having two doctors in different yeah. hospital systems and different cities, there there was no cohesive care team, including family. Yeah. Or even, you know, if your dad, if your mom let your dad go to the neurology appointments. Right. Again, so those helped? little things that I think were behaviors leading up to, you know, everything kind of coming to a head in December, but yeah. subtle personality changes were like, boy, why would mom be like aggressively not wanting him to yeah. accompany her? And so I think what's in really important is I, I like my takeaway is one, you know, even if you do have like for anybody who has Parkinson's, um, you know, make sure you do have somebody that comes along with you to your appointments at some point in time and but don't let them be the only ones in the know you know so like like you said if you were a part of that group early on or like with the neurologist or like that's where i get so hung up on the fact that when people keep it a secret or they don't want to they don't want to share it or talk about it things like this happen and it's like this is that was life-changing i mean that would like upended you guys like it was i can't yeah. imagine how going through that and now to know that your mom's on the complete other end of like yeah. they figured it like you could like things not everything in life you can figure things out but it's like they were able to figure it out and now yeah. she's she's good and yeah. you know what i mean so yeah. i don't know what do you think it's crazy how the stupid diseases affects everybody differently yeah and at the timing, so like the things that like I had the drop foot, I haven't had the drop foot for a couple of probably Same. four or four, five years and mm -hmm. things come and go, mm -hmm. you know, so. Did they, and I, I should, we should look into this, but do, do we, do you know like how, how often Parkinson's psychosis happens? I don't have the figures in front of me, but when I was researching it, it said it's underreported. And so they don't feel mm -hmm. like the statistics match what the actual numbers are. Okay. Um, there's stigma and worry, you know, just yeah. the, the term psychosis, um, that they just feel like it's not something that people are willing to talk about um, as much as they should. And because of the stigma, but that it's not somebody shouldn't be afraid of it and that it's a part of Parkinson's, mm -hmm. but there's a treatment for it. And yeah. it's just one of those things that just isn't often talked about enough. So Leah, as, as we kind of close this out, what would you, as the, as a child of a parent who has Parkinson's and, and being that part of the care group team, what advice would you give other people that are in your situation because there's a lot of them that are our age and their parents are you know dealing with parkinson's yeah i think i um understood that it was okay to have a voice in this i felt like it was a strange you know being my dad being her number one care partner i kind of felt like i was on the outside of it mm -hmm. and that you know, it's truly a, a partnership and that um, it was OK for me to voice my concerns and want to be my mom's advocate and just try to explain to my dad that, you know, with my sister and I's medical backgrounds, we can bring something different to the table mm -hmm. and we're just all part of the support team and that they're not in it alone. And even if we're not right there with them all the time, that we're we're all a part of the same team yeah. and that, um, you know, we're only harming ourselves if we're, we're not keeping everybody yeah. informed and in the loop. So not feeling like I had to keep on the peripheral of everything, mm -hmm. but that, you know, I had just as much of a voice, um, as he did when it came to understanding what was going on and how to support my mom and, and get the, the care that she needed. Yeah. 
Well, thank you so much for opening up and sharing. Yeah, it's been a lot. All of this. I mean, I know this was a long episode, but I think there, it's just to hear all those details and knowing it's like so many people, I know people will be able to relate, maybe not necessarily to the psychosis piece, but just, you know, the changes like the, and this is a degenerative disease. And so we have to be aware of, you know, the changes while they might happen overnight, there's still like those red flags up front. So just, again, just being more aware and being more open with your family and friends so they can help you. So. Yeah, and not being afraid to talk about Parkinson's. Yeah. It's, not, it's not scary. And I want yeah. my mom to feel like she can talk about it. Yeah. And we can talk about it with her and still love her for who she is. And again, like she doesn't have a big letter P on her forehead. Yeah. She's my mom. And She's we love her no mom. matter what. Yeah. We got we to gotta be able to talk to each yeah. other to help each other. Hence the title, The Secret Life of Parkinson's. Everybody likes to keep it a secret, but we're trying to speak it out. Change the stigma. Change the stigma. Well, Leah, thank you again so much um, for joining us. Um, in our, I'll leave, I don't, I'm just going to try and figure out what my last 30 seconds is going to be. But in our last 30 seconds, I will leave you all with this. With Parkinson's, as I said, it is a neurodegenerative disease. So it is going to progress, not necessarily overnight, but over an extended period of time. So you have to be aware of yourself as a patient, but as a care partner, friend, family member, whomever, just always having your eye, not totally on the patient and, you know, giving us a, a huge spotlight by any means, but you can tell the changes in certain behaviors and just making sure that you're, you know, upfront or you can talk to the patient about it. You can talk to their doctors, whatever it may be, because you can help. Hopefully we can all help ourselves get better the more we talk about it and break down that stigma. So with that, We'll leave it for next time. Thanks so much for watching.